Good morning once again. <clears throat> we appreciate uh, everybody showing up today, and we are going to get right into the Word. Now, let me grab something here. See if it's here. Oh, there it is. <coughs> there we go. Okay. Knew I had it somewhere. Now, you can turn with me first to Genesis chapter 30. <coughs> now, how many of you have heard of the sacred cows that we've been talking about? You know, just the term sacred cows. All right. Well, we have some little cards that have the sacred cows on them. And on the, it'll say one thing on the front, and it'll give you a question, and it gives you the answer. And, but it brings up these sacred cows and says, what is this? What's the truth about it? That kind of thing. And so we uh, put these together. It's actually called the... Sacred Cow Slaughterhouse. <laughs> so, um, but it's really for you to, it's not just something to carry in your pocket. It's really for life teams that they can use this and it's like almost like role playing and they'll ask questions and how to answer them and that kind of stuff. Who would like this? Oh, right there we go. Right there. All right. <clears throat> there you go. All right. Well, <clears throat> have you found Genesis chapter 30? Yes. Okay. Now I can read it to you out of the King James. I could, I usually do, but I'm going to read it out of the ESV, the English Standard Version, and just because it's generally easier to understand overall. So if you're reading along with the King James, that's fine, you'll get it too. <clears throat> Verse 25, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you that I may go, for you know the service that I've given you. Now, the reason he said wives was because you know the story, right? He worked for one, and then <laughs> Laban slipped another one in there, right? And so he being a man of integrity, even though Laban wasn't, uh, he being a man of inter integrity, he worked again another seven years after that and got hit the wife he wanted. Is that, do you remember the story? Okay, now, <clears throat> so... He said, now, I've, I've, I've served you. I've done everything. Send me away. Let me go. Release me. <clears throat> he says in verse 27, but Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, well, that would have been kind of hard to do because he tricked him into another seven years into a different wife. All right? I mean, so there you go. He said, I have learned. Now, look at this. I have, this is Laban speaking. Not a godly man. I have learned by divination, which is expressly prohibited in the Bible, right? That the Lord has blessed me because of you. You hear that? Yeah. Now, he, you could see him as his employer. Well, that's the way it should be with us. Your employer should understand that the reason he, he's blessed is because you work for him. Amen? Amen? Amen. And that was the very situation. Now, notice at the beginning, it said, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph. So now you see what kind of family... Joseph was born into, right? I mean, you know, the, the, I'm talking about the entire tribe. I'm talking about the mindset of the Hebrews at the time. This is why Joseph prospered so much, right, later on because of his integrity. Now, then he says in verse 29 or in verse 28, so Laban is saying, name your wages and I will give it. In other words, no, just stay, just stay. Just tell me what you want, right? Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I have served you. 
and how your livestock has fared with me. In other words, you've prospered. <clears throat> your animals are producing even more than they would if I wasn't here, right? For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? In other words, I've been building up your stuff, now it's time for me to go do my own household and build up my own household. He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. Hear that? You, notice, it sounds a little bit like Abraham. Same character as Abraham, right? You shall not give me anything. I will do this for you. I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. Now, watch this. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you, okay? <clears throat> he says, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. So he said, I'm going to take all of the speckled ones, all that stuff out of, and then you're going to come and inspect, and you're going to see, and if you find a speckled one here, then you can count it stolen, right? <clears throat> then he said, Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. He goes, hey, this sounds like a good deal, right? Uh, so he said, <clears throat> now watch. He said, good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. So they made an agreement and here's Laban up to his old tricks. He's trying to make sure, right? Because what's going to happen with this? <clears throat> what he's telling him is, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to remove all these spotted things and then I'll have only these certain type of sheep and goats and all these things. And he said, and, and eventually, uh, <clears throat> what's going to be my pay are going to be the spotted and striped ones, right? And so Laban says, yeah, sounds like a, like a great idea. And so then Laban comes in and moves all that stuff because he thinks that's how they reproduce the spotted and striped. So he removes all them and says, if he only has, you know, the, basically the white sheep here and the white goats, then he's going to have a hard time getting any spotted or striped and he's going to have to leave here with very little, or he may even decide to stay here because he has nothing. You see? Real trickster. I mean, that's, this guy is just no good, right? So, and, but now the amazing thing is, it's amazing how people can think they can get over on the people of God. You know, as if God isn't watching. God sees. He knows. Isn't that right? Now watch. He says... Uh, he removed them all and put them in charge of his sons. Now watch this. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. <clears throat> so he made, it, he made sure there is no way any of these goats or sheep are going to wander over, right, amongst the spotted and striped. So he moved them three days apart. right? So then and he thinks, okay, I, I've hedged my bet here. This is going to be a good deal. Then Jacob took fresh, now watch this. Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white streaks in them because these are dark, kind of dark uh, limbs and branches. And then he would just cut some spots and he cut out pieces of them and it had white uh, inside. And so now he's got what looks like spotted sticks. Okay. Exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs. That is the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. Now, one of them, now I'm going to read the rest of it, but remember that. Just remember that. In other words... All these were all the same color, sheep, goats, all that kind of stuff, right? And, and the, all the others have been separated, and now they got these. And so here Jacob goes out, takes some sticks, cuts just little pieces out of them so that it is straight. He didn't peel them all together, right? He cut, because he, he didn't want them all one color, right? And so he cut different pieces out, so, and he laid them in front of the troughs. So whenever these animals would come up to drink, they would see 
the sticks. Isn't that something? And because they bred there, they produced spotted and striped sticks. Now, there's a bunch of different ways I could go with this. <clears throat> and all of them would be maybe interesting and beneficial. Because <clears throat> what, what I want to emphasize is this, two things, and then we're going to come back to the main point. <clears throat> what happens, number one, notice, <clears throat> you will adapt to your surroundings even if you don't pay attention to them. Subconsciously, subliminally, the things that are around you, you will gravitate to that. Now, that also goes for people around you. We've talked about this during the mind renewal. If you're around diligent people, you tend to be diligent or separate yourself from them. If you're around slothful people, you tend to become slothful unless you separate yourself from them. Now, the Bible is very clear about being diligent and not being slothful. Isn't that right? And it's something you don't even think about, but gradually over time, you will move toward the commonly accepted atmosphere that you're around. Right? And that's one of the things. See, a lot of people say, well, but you don't understand. I'm trying to reach them. I'm going into that because I'm trying to reach them. That, that's fine. And you can go in to reach them, but then you've got to come out from among them. Because if you go in to reach them and you stay among them, you'll become like them rather than them becoming like you. See? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't minister to them. and I, I'm not saying that at all. You should. But you also cannot partake in the lifestyle or you'll become like them. And when you become like them, you can no longer win them because then they're going to say, well, why do we need to change? You're like us. Right? So, now watch. Here's the thing that stands out. If we read on, it says, yeah, uh, verse 40. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black and the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flocks or flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. The stronger, notice this. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. <laughs> making sure now that Laban got the weaker stock. Okay. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Well, Laban was, you know, he, he, he was pretty deceptive, right? But you have to remember, Jacob, his name means deceiver. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you know, you can't con a con, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so you think you're getting, if you think you're going to get over on Jacob, <laughs> you might think you are, you know, you might get 10 of his dollars while he's getting 100 of yours. <laughs> All right? So he says, now watch. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, camels, and donkeys. Amen? So, but now notice this. And this is the point I want to get to. Notice these animals were of one color. But they produced animals of different colors. Why? And they didn't even, they, he didn't have to take the, you know, the goats and sheep over there and hold their face toward the striped things and stuff. It was just in the process of life. They would go to get drink. They would go to drink the water. They bred in front of that. They saw it. So what was around them, they produced. Not only did, they, now notice, they didn't change, but they produced something that didn't even look like them just because of what they saw. Do you get that? So here's the question. Here's what I want to ask you today. What do you see? What do you see? Amen? Let's look at it. This is a lot more in-depth, you might say. Go with me to Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And the reason I can ask you, what do you see? And you're going to see why I'm specifically why I'm asking that. But I am biblical in asking that. All right? Verse 22, and he, Jesus, cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, now that's an unusual anointing, okay? One most people don't want to be the recipient of, right? He spit on his eyes, and he put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw anything. You hear that? So what was Jesus saying? What do you see? 
So see, if Jesus can ask you that, I can ask you that. Right? So he asked the blind man, what do you see? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. What does that mean? That means that they were, it was blurry, and it, it looked like a tree walking, right? But he obviously was not seeing men. But he said, I see men. He knew they were men, but I see them as trees walking, right? After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. So here's the point. You might not see clearly at first, but you can see clearly because Jesus can make you see clearly. Amen? Amen? So again, what is the question? What do you see? Because if you see things blurry, if you don't see things correctly, if you don't see them accurately, then you're not going to be able to respond to them accurately, and it will give you a wrong idea. I mean, think about this. What if he had walked off at that point? You know? And he would have lived the rest of his life with blurred vision. Right? Jesus laid his hands on him again. Okay? Now, notice he said in verse 26, And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. So that right there proves that Jesus did not heal the sick to prove he was God, to prove he was, you know, trying. It, was, it wasn't an advertisement. It was help for a blind man. He wasn't trying to be anybody. You know, understand what I'm saying? He wasn't trying to gather a following. He didn't say, all right, Peter, get the camera ready. We got we to gotta get this on YouTube. We're going to have one shot at it. So I'm going to heal this blind man, man's eyes, and I want it uploaded real quick, right? You know, the, 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 <laughs> the bag's a little low. We, we got to upload some YouTube, get some finances coming in here, right? Modern Christianity, okay? So let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith. Now, you can go back. It says therefore, so you might want to go back and read what's before so you'll know what it's there for, right? So we're going to say, we're, but we're going to start in verse 16 just for the sake of time. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only, which is of the law, but to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham. So notice now you got people, he's, he's differentiating two kinds of people, people who were under the law and people who were of the faith of Abraham, right? Now, technically, we are under the faith of Abraham, right? We were never under the law. Now, notice what's amazing is you have Abraham, and the law, because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, he's making with Jesus, but Abraham was the physical representative at the time. The law came later through Moses because of the covenant he made with Abraham. But the law was to those who were under the law and not to those who had faith like Abraham. You see that? Now watch. He says, uh, but to that also, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Both tribes. Isn't that right? They're both groups, if you want to call it that. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but even this week, there uh, have been some amazing things happen uh, in the world, right? Uh, with, with covenants and treaties and agreements being made between massive uh, Arab nations in Israel. First time in history, right? That this many things has happened like this and that this number of groups... Uh, has gone on like this, and, and you know, and I don't know if y'all realize, but what was it? Friday was it Friday? It was the beginning of Rosh Hashanah? Okay, and the 28th and 29th, I think, is the, or the 28th technically is the beginning of uh, Yom Kippur. A lot of stuff happening right about now. Amen. So we're getting into those areas of those uh, feasts that have not yet been fulfilled, right? But God's good at keeping his word. Amen. Okay? So, notice he says here, verse 17, because he's talking about Abraham. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God. Right? So God is saying that to him. And he says what? Even God. Now he describes God. Who quickens the dead. 
makes alive the dead, okay, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's, that's a description of how God does things. It's what he does and how he does it. God is in the business of giving life. He's not in the business of giving death. He's in the business of quickening the dead. You got that? Now, that, and you're going to see, when he says quickens the dead, he's technically, see, for some reason, as uh, Westerners many times, we think very categorically. Whereas the Bible and uh, Middle Eastern people tend to think more holistic. You know, well, if you call Jesus a healer, if you say Jesus is a healer, you, oh, yes, praise God, thank you, by his stripes, I'm healed, and I thank you that he heals my body. But see, that's only, that's really a Western mindset. That's not a Middle Eastern mindset. Jesus was a healer to the Middle Eastern mindset because he healed spirit, soul, and body. Not just body. And so you couldn't divide it up. So you have to go back to the mindset of the people that wrote the Bible to understand whenever it says something, what it's saying about them. So here, when he says, and you're going to see this, I'm telling you the truth, just, and I'm accurate in this, because of where it's written. Because in this, he's talking about Abraham so when he's talking about Abraham and he says, who quickens the dead, remember, he, he just said, who, I've, he said, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He said that before Abraham fathered any nations. So he was calling things which be not as though they were. So when he gives the description of who quickens the dead and calls things which not as though they were, he is describing what God, how God, what God does and how he does it. But he's also describing right then, what God did with Abraham. How did God quicken the dead with Abraham? Well, it tells us right here, you're going to see in just a minute, it says that Abraham's body was dead. Sarah's womb was dead. But God made it alive so, that he could produce, so they could produce children, right? So if God says, you're the father of many nations and your body doesn't function to produce that, you would rejoice knowing it's God because that means he's going to have to fix your body. Do you see that? So if God gives a promise and the promise doesn't look like where you are right now, rejoice because he's got to bring it to pass and he's got to use his power to do it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now watch. And there's a, there's a lot more to this. I mean, this is... Okay. He says here, <clears throat> watch this. Who calleth those things which be not as though they were. <clears throat> Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So he was hoping against hope that, that, he could act, that God could actually do that and that it would come to pass. But notice he was hoping against hope. In other words, there was no reason for him to even think that was possible. But he decided to go, wow. Is that? Now notice, it, he didn't say, but he had faith in a hopeless situation. He, they didn't use that word. He had hope. You have to realize that before you can have faith, you've got to have hope. Isn't that right? These three things remain. Faith, hope, charity, love. Isn't that right? Why is hope so important? Because hope, I've actually heard it said this way before. It's a great way to describe it. Hope is the blueprint for faith. See, before you can have faith, you've got to have a, a blueprint of what that faith can produce, and hope is that blueprint. If you don't have hope, you don't have faith. See, you can't have faith without hope, because faith is believing that it's going to come to pass, but before you can have that faith, you've got to have hope that it's even possible for God to do it. And if you believe all things are possible to God, then you should have lots of hope. Amen? Now, watch what he says. And he says, so shall thy seed be. So he was believing hope against hope. Okay, uh, my seed's going to be like this, and, but yet the body doesn't work, so God's going to have to do something so that I can have seed to become great in the earth like he said, right? Just putting it all together. Verse 19. Now watch this. Here's where you find it. Here, this is what you got to get a hold of. <clears throat> and being not weak in faith. Not weak in faith. So if you're not weak in faith, what are you? Strong in faith. Okay, good. And being not weak in faith, now the King James says, he considered not his own body now dead. Now, maybe you, some of you have a different translation. If you go back to the original Greek, it actually 
Understand what it says. It doesn't actually say it that way. Actually, in the original Greek, it says he considered his body. Now, see, that sounds like the opposite, doesn't it? But if you look at the whole sentence, you'll see what it means. It says, because here it says, he considered not his own body now dead. But now notice, in the original Greek, it says, he considered his body, but then gave no weight to it. Yeah. And, okay, what does that mean? That means faith isn't stupid. Faith is not blind. Right? Faith, you know, well, faith is, you know, you, you leap before you look. No, no. Faith has the blueprint of hope. Right? So whenever it says, because in the King James, you could say that that statement is still correct. Because he considered not his own body, now dead. In other words, he looked at it, he considered it, but then didn't give it any authority, any weight in his thinking. So technically, he considered not his own body. He looked at it, but then he didn't consider it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's kind of funny because <clears throat> the, between the Greek and the King James, both are right, even though they say almost exactly the opposite. Isn't that strange? Anyway. <clears throat> he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old. Neither yet, <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he took that into consideration too and didn't care. He's like, yep, yeah, these are the facts, but God's above the facts. <clears throat> Amen? See, Christian science denies the facts. Christian faith recognizes the facts, but recognizes God's above the facts. Amen. And so <clears throat> he says, uh, verse 20, now watch this. Here's, here's where you get down to it. He staggered not. We could use say, we could even say he wavered not. Right? He staggered not <clears throat> at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now notice, when you are strong in faith, you're going to give glory to God. <clears throat> and it says he was giving glory to God. How did he give glory to God? He had to give glory to God by saying, you can do this. And I believe you. And we're going to start making plans. And we're going to, and, and so he had to give glory to God, even though he had no physical evidence of anything. And, and we know it took a while, right, for the promise to come, because eventually they got tired of waiting and went toward the flesh and produced a son out of the flesh, Ishmael. And then <clears throat> eventually... God gave the son of the, the promised son. Is that right? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> he says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now watch, verse 21. And being fully persuaded. Not kinda. Fully. What does that mean? That means there's no backing down, no backing off. You know what this means? This means that he spoke this out loud in front of people. He didn't wait for any evidence. He began speaking it. And the first way he spoke it was he honored what God said. From now on, I'm calling you Abraham instead of Abram. See, when he changed that, imagine that. Because he knew people. <clears throat> He'd walk around and they'd go, oh, look, there's Abram. And he'd walk up and they'd say, Abram, how you doing? No, 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 Abraham. What do you mean Abraham? Your name's Abram. No, no, no. God changed my name. Why would he change your name? You're 100 years old, Abram. Why would he change your name from Abram to Abraham? Abraham means father of many nations. Why would he change that? You're not a father of many nations. God said I am. Amen. God said I am. <clears throat> now think about that. So he had to stand strong. You know these people laughed at him. <clears throat> now it doesn't say his mother-in-law was still alive or not, but you know she laughed. <laughs> you, you can just pretty well guarantee it, right? <clears throat> Now watch. And being fully persuaded. Here's what he was fully persuaded of. That what he, God had promised, he was able also to perform. Fully persuaded. And th now watch this. <clears throat> and therefore, therefore why? Because he was fully persuaded. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Do you hear that? <clears throat> Do you realize he was, it was imputed to him for righteousness 
based on the fact that he, and that's what it says, that he believed that God could do what he said he would do. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He said, God, I, I, I believe you can do what you say you're going to do. And God said, you're righteous. Amen. Can you imagine that? Just because he believed that God could do what he said he could do. And, and it's funny because it shows some things. Because he said, you know, at one point, uh, whenever he goes and tells Sarah, and he says, uh, listen, here's what God said. We're going to have kids, so get ready. <laughs> right? And it said, she laughed. <laughs> but yet it said, Abraham didn't waver. He didn't stagger. Her laughing didn't change him. Didn't go, well, yeah, no, I know. I've had a lot of wild dreams, but, you know, maybe, maybe you're right, you know. No, he, he, he didn't stagger. You know, he didn't waver in that sense. Now, and he did some things that weren't exactly right. You know, <laughs> you would think he would waver, but maybe he wasn't wavering. But Sarah ends up saying, hey, take Hagar and have a kid. But he still didn't waver. So he still knew God was going to bring it to pass. It didn't even say he technically believed that God was going to bring it to pass through Hagar. Well, that would kind of make you want to question his motives with Hagar. <laughs> Hey, can we be real, right? It's like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> but God's still going to do it another way. See, there's a whole lot in the Bible. <laughs> Amen? If you actually made a movie based on what the Bible actually says, it'd probably be R-rated. Especially if you did Samson's life. Right? Or David's. <laughs> Either one. Okay? Now watch, it was imputed to him for righteousness. But now notice what Abraham did. He was strong in faith. He didn't waver. He didn't stagger. He didn't stagger through unbelief. He was fully persuaded. I mean, he was, he, he was this thing was going to happen. Amen? <clears throat> and he says he's the father of us all. And then he says that we are to follow the faith of Abraham. Is that right? Yes, Do you realize that every time Abraham said, my name is Abraham, he was imitating God. He was calling things which be not as though they were. Now, if it didn't work, he was going to look real foolish. But when it did, he stood out as a giant of faith. Because everything was going against him. Amen? Now watch. <clears throat> Go with me to Second Peter <clears throat> chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, I preached on this last week also a little bit and touched on it. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. You hear that? Promises. Okay? Now, if you remember, now, I'm, I have mine printed out like this, so it's, you know, Romans 4 and 2 Peter 1 isn't on the same page in your Bible. Well, I had nothing to do with that, okay? But if you could go back to uh, Romans 4, 21, it says, and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised. So then you go down and read this, and it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So how did... Abraham have a real, live, physical son because he believed God and believed that God could do what he promised. And now we've got exceeding great and precious promises. And we are to follow the faith of Abraham, which means Abraham was calling those things which be not as though they were. So Abraham was taking the promise and saying, this is now. This is true. God can do this. So if we're going to follow the faith of Abraham, then we have to take these precious promises and begin to speak them knowing that God is able to do what he has promised. And by these precious promises, we become partakers of God's nature. And how do you become partakers of God's nature? Well, it's not just goodness and holiness. And that. God's nature is to speak and to call things which be not as though they were. That's his nature. That's how he does things. So if you're going to follow the faith of Abraham, you're going to do things the way God did it and does it. Amen? 
Do you see this? So you, now we know that, as I said last week, all the promises are in him, yes, and in him, so be it. Amen, right? So you can take any promise and begin to speak that promise. Now, you have to be fully persuaded for it to work. But the way that works, as you've even learned probably from this the mind renewal uh, this week, is that you begin to say it, and you might not be fully persuaded when you start saying it, but by saying it and meditating on it and saying it to yourself and saying it out loud, then you become more and more fully persuaded. That's, right. that's, why, Abra that's why God changed Abram's name to Abraham so that every time, he, every time he said it, it would get stronger. But then as soon as he corrected everybody and said, I am no longer Abraham, if you call me, I'm no longer Abram. If you call me Abram, I will not answer you. You will call me Abraham because God changed my name. And then he had to convince everybody that. And when they started, now after that, from then on, he didn't hear Abram anymore. Everybody started saying Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And every time he heard it, he would probably stop and go, yes. I remember that promise. Yes, I am a father of many nations. God, you are, I mean, think about it. Every time he heard that, he probably stopped and glorified God, giving glory to God. Strong in faith, glorifying God and saying, you are the God that keeps his promise. Amen. And I am a father of many nations. And I thank you that you said my seed will be mighty upon this earth. And I thank you for it. Think about that. Every time somebody said that, it would be cause for him to stop and give praise to God. And then try and go, yes, you called me? What did you want? Right? And so just think about the life that he had. To, his whole life had to change in the sense that of what people were calling him and what he said and all these different things going on. Now, <clears throat> notice, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, this is 2 Peter 1, 4, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, notice, by doing this, you're escaping corruption. You get that? You're escaping corruption. And beside this, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, which is self-governance, okay? <clears throat> uh, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, or love that gives without thinking about getting back. For if these things be in you, now listen carefully, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now many of you, if you were here last week, you heard this because I actually taught on this whole thing. But look at this next verse, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Now we're back to seeing something. Do you see how that comes right back into it? Yeah. You, you, what are you seeing? What do you see? Right? You're blind. Now watch this. And cannot see afar off. Now that takes you right back to the man that saw men as trees walking. Couldn't see it far off. Why? Because everything was still blurry, right? Now watch this other part. And, so that means with this, not, oh, also you might be this. No, it's this and this. So if you're this, you're also this. Does that make sense? That's why the conjunction and is there, right? And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Notice See, this is where it comes in. If you cannot see yourself different, how do you see yourself different? You've got to see yourself in the Bible. Okay? Uh, T.L. Osborne's talking about the woman, the sermon that Hattie Hammond preached back, way back. And he said, he'll never forget that sermon because that sermon said, the title of the sermon was, You Must See Jesus. And then she said, You must see Jesus three ways. First off, you must see Jesus in the Bible. He said, then secondly, she said, secondly, you must see Jesus in a man. And then thirdly, you must see Jesus in you. Now, watch this. Because he says, if you lack these things, okay? Why? Because if you're going to, now notice, if you're going to be, take the divine nature of God, you're going to have, first off, diligence to do these things, but you're going to have faith you're going to have virtue, you're going to have knowledge, you're going to have temperance, you're going to have patience, you're going to have godliness, you're going to have brotherly kindness, and you're going to have love. Isn't that right? Those are all characteristics of the divine nature of God. 
And so he says, now, if you have these things, okay, if you have them, you're in a bound, then you'll never be barren. You'll never be unfruitful. Everything you put your hand to is going to work. Isn't that right? Then he says, but if you lack these things, you are blind, cannot see afar off, and have forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. That's where most Christians live. They live still bearing the sins that were, that, that, and uh, honestly, they're, they're not even bearing the sins. They're bearing the remembrance. When you remember something, you see in pictures. And all you're seeing is a picture of your old sin. Why? Because your sin, the actual sin and the consequence of it were washed away by the blood. They were removed by the blood and you've been freed from it. But as long as you see that picture, you're always going to be living it and you're going to forget that your sins, that you were purged of your old sins. And when, you're, when you forget that you were purged from your old sins, you walk around trying to carry that, and you'll never step out in faith. Why? Because your own heart, your own conscience, the Bible says, will condemn you. Yeah. And if, you can, if your conscience, uh, Bible, if your conscience condemns you, you have no confidence toward God. What is confidence? Faith. So if your conscience condemns you, now understand, it's your conscience. It's, it's not God condemning you. Your sins have been removed. Do you get that? It is not God condemning you. It is your conscience. You have forgotten that you are forgiven. And because of that, you're still carrying the weight of that, even though it's not even real anymore. And yet you're still carrying that. And yet you walk around with this, with, with this consciousness of sin that is not even a part of you anymore, but you're walking around, remember, oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I did this, that. Oh, I did that. And then, and then you, of course, you always have, you know, the devil's helpers, you know, Job's friends. You know, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. Well, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't do that. If you were a real Christian, you wouldn't say that. Well, I can't believe you did that. I've just, you know, I, I thought, you know, you were better than that. I thought, no. You see, and then you, and you walk around, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I was bad. Yeah, I did this. No, uh, yeah, I guess I'll never change. I guess. I, and you walk around with that weight of that thing. And when you do that, your conscience condemns you. Not God, right. your conscience. And when your conscience condemns you, you have no confidence toward God. When no confidence toward God means no faith towards God. And without faith towards God, you don't get anything from God. Right. Why? Because you have to have faith. Faith pleases God. Amen? Amen. And so Amen. this is a process. But notice it has to do, and if you walk around, and here's the thing, if you walk around with that sense of, of sin consciousness and your conscience weighing you down and condemning you, the Bible says you are blind. You hear that? Yeah. Can't see afar off. And so you're blind. And because of that, because you're blind, if you're blind, guess what? There's no need to ask a blind man what he sees. Jesus didn't ask the blind man before he healed him, what do you see? Amen. He ministered to him and then said, what do you see? Amen. Why? Because a blind man doesn't see anything. That's right. That's right. And what does that mean? That means that when a blind, okay, what, let's just take this simple and, you know, put it together. When you see, okay, if you're blind, you don't see. When you see, what do we say you have? Sight, another word. Vision. And where there is no vision, the people perish. Why? Because you run out of gas. You just, when your conscience condemns you, you have no faith towards God, you're not receiving anything from God, and pretty soon you just kind of give up. You just, you just run out of gas. You're just like, what's the use? Why even try? Nothing's ever going to change. Do you see how, all, how this thing works and how the enemy tries to just tie it all together. So the question is, what do you see? Now, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> I'm going to pick up here on verse 10 because this will take you to it. Verse 10, wherefore the rather, brethren. In, in other, when he says wherefore the rather, what does that mean? Okay, besides that, okay, rather than that, do this. Isn't that right? We were talking about that, but rather... Rather than being like that, be like this, okay? Rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So now there's something to that. If we have to give diligence to make it sure, 
then there's an aspect of us in this. See, we have to realize we are co-workers with God. Not just when we lay the hands on the sick. You know, when I'm co-working with God, I'm going to lay the hands and he's going to heal them. No, no. In every part of your life, in every, in every part, God, you're a co-worker with God. You're a co-worker with God every, to, to build your life into a better life, into a, a being, I don't want to say just a better person. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about just being a good person or a better person. But I'm saying when I, when I talk about building, uh, being a co-worker with God, the Bible says you are his husbandry. That's an old English word. It means you're his garden. In other words, he's planted his word, the seed of his word into you, and he wants to cultivate it and bring it out. And when that seed grows up, you look like Jesus because the word is Jesus, or Jesus is the word made flesh. So all of these characteristics are in there, and God is trying to help and grow these things up. So you have to be a co-worker with him and actually bring these things into your life. You're not going to just sit back and go, well, okay, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. No, if that were true, you wouldn't have to give diligence to anything. But over and over again, we're told, give diligence. Be diligent, amen? amen. To make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things... You shall never fail. Wow. Now you talk about an exceeding great and precious promise. Can you imagine? What would you do if you knew you could not fail? Now think about that. What, what would you do? You see, people, I mean, think about it. Now I'm not talking necessarily about being stupid, but how many of you know faith sometimes looks stupid until it, it comes to fruition and comes to pass? You know? You, you, and again, I don't know anything about you know, stock market and stuff. I mean, I've looked at it before, but never been involved in it. But imagine if you had this stock that, you know, wherever it was at, it was just low, bottom. And you look at it. I mean, let's say you're reading it, and it just stands out to you. And you go, you know what? I'm going to put X amount of dollars in there. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put $500, $5,000, $10,000. I'm going to put whatever. I'm going to put money in there. And everybody would laugh at you. Are you kidding me? That thing eh, has been dropping. It's, you know, we're not even sure it's at the bottom yet. And you put some money in there. Guess what? You putting money in it will make it come back up. Why? Because whatever you do shall never fail. Think about that. You can go in there and look at that and go, okay, show me the worst thing you got. And I'll make it good. Why? Just because I'm getting involved. Now, I know that, that sounds crazy. And that would not be advice that your stockbroker would give you. Right? Here's what I want you to do. Go home and look for the worst possible stock, and we're going to dump all your money in it, right? That's not what you're going to hear, okay? But if you know that God is with you and that whatever you put your hands to is blessed, then you start realizing, just like we read with Jacob and Laban, I know my business, my flocks are blessed because of you. And so you start to realize, okay, if I, he said, if I do these things, I shall never fail. Isn't that right? Okay. Then he says, watch this. Verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you, given unto you, you'll have an entrance, right? Abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet or right, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, he's talking about in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. In other words, I'm, I'm writing this stuff down. I'm passing these things on so that I'm so committed to reminding you. Think about that. To reminding you. He said, man, I wish you'd give me revelation. I'm tired of hearing the same thing every week. And yet here's Paul saying, or Peter saying, my purpose on this earth is to continue to remind you of these things. And matter of fact, I am so committed to it that I'm making sure that even after I die, you will be reminded. Hallelujah. Right? Well, see, that's a good thing now because now with the technology we got, Dr. Summerall still preaching. Amen. Died in 1996. Yep. Still preaching every day. You can go to Tulsa, turn on, he's there. You go to a lot of places, even here, you can turn on, he's still preaching. Dead, you know, dead yet still speaking. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've got 
material out all over the world. We've got material on the internet. We've got material, physical material, where people can listen to it, watch it. We got books people can read. Long after I'm gone, I'll still be preaching. Amen. Amen? Yes. Which is the reason why I am so dogmatic on making sure that what I say is right. Amen. Because if it's wrong, it'll always be wrong. And there and there'll be generations after me, you know, should the world go on that long and all that stuff that will pick those messages up and keep going. And the last thing I want to do is keep making more people wrong. And so, but that, that's still out there. Now watch. He says, wherefore, well, let me go on down. He said in verse 16, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more, now get this, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now think about that. They were standing there with the Son of the living God and they hear a voice from heaven, and he says, we were there. Jesus received honor and glory in the fact that God spoke to him audibly. We heard it. We were there. These aren't fables. We were there. We heard it with our own ears. And then he turns around and goes, but we have a more sure word of prophecy, even more than what they heard with their own ears. What is that more sure word of prophecy? It's called the Bible. Why? Because it is written. It don't change. That's right. That's right. There are all kinds of voices, Paul said, all kinds of voices in this world. There's earthly voices, heavenly voices, angelic voices, all kinds, demonic voices, all kinds of voices. And he said, but we have a more, and, and Paul was saying there's, you know, celestial, terrestrial, all that kind of stuff. And he said, but now think about this. You got all these kind of voices. And then in the middle of that, you got... Peter saying, we have a more sure word than even a voice from heaven. Because let me tell you, every cult started by somebody hearing a voice. Oh, yeah. and, and an angel uh, you know, of light showed up to give them revelation. Yeah. You know? And so we have to make sure that, and people think that hearing a voice is the ultimate if you're a boy, man, you must be spiritual. No, no, no. <laughs> Reading this word, believing it, acting on it is the ultimate. Amen. You will not be deceived if you do that. Amen? Amen? And then if you hear a voice, and you could, but if you do, it will align with this, yes, right. or you completely disregard it. Yes, right. Why? Because God cannot speak anything that would go against what he has already said. And see, if you build on that, you will never need to fear wrong doctrine or anything else. Amen. Now, very quickly, finishing up. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. What is he? See, that's been so misused. Okay? What that says, and it's funny because people say, see that right there, no private interpretation. So you can't take that for yourself because that would be private interpretation. No, no, no. He is saying it is of no private interpretation. In other words, this is not just for one person. It's for everybody. Amen. Go back and look and look at the context and look at the words used Go back, study your, you know, go into your concordance and that, and look up the Greek words. He is not saying that you can't take these promises and live them. He is saying no one has a right to cut you out of a promise. Does that make sense? So, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So here's the questions. What do you see? Because what you see 
is what you say. And what you say is what you will produce, right? It's what you'll have. So what do you see? I can tell what you're seeing by what you're saying. So the key is, what are you saying? Because what you're saying reflects what you're seeing. Because all words are is what you're, you're trying to describe in detail what your mind is seeing. And so if you see everything is bad, then you're going to say, and what's going to come out of your mouth is things that are bad. And you can have two people, like we said this week, you can have two people uh, in the exact same circumstances. And one will say everything is horrible, and the other one will say, man, things are great. And you can look, even in, I mean, this, this isn't just spiritual, right? Yeah, I mean, it is definitely spiritual, but it's not just spiritual. You have to realize, you, there are investors Let's take it back to the world of finance. There are investors out there right now. And you got some of them that are so afraid. Some have even committed suicide because of the things they lost and that stuff. Why? Because you know why? Because they could not see a far off. All they could see was a short term. And the ones that could see long term, they're like, oh, man, this is, you know what that means? That means I can buy more stock. It gets cheap. When it gets cheap, you can buy more. And people say, well, you're stupid putting your money in there because, look, it's going down. No, no, no. You got people see it and go, oh, it's terrible. Get your money out quick. And then everything starts dropping. Then the others are standing there going, this is great. This is the time. And you, every time like this, every recession uh, where you see the stock and all that, you go back. There are always, when, when it comes back, and it always does, you what? Go back and do your research on the times this has happened. There has always been an abundance of instant-made millionaires. Right after that. Now, I'm not telling you to go invest in the stock. I'm a, that's none of my business, and I don't care, and I don't have any in there, so I got no vested interest in it. I'm just, I'm showing you that you can have people, there are people out there right now in the business world, some are going, oh my, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and we got we to gotta withdraw. And you got other people out there going, oh man, what am I going to do? I, there is so much opportunity here, I cannot believe it. <laughs> So you have two people in the exact same circumstances seeing exactly the opposite, right? And now as people of faith, we should be positive. Amen? Amen. That's just how we should live. And we should see long-term because we're not blind. We, have, we remember that we have been purged from our old sins. Our conscience is clear before God. It's clear before man. And we have faith towards God so that we know if we put something toward anything, we put our hands toward it, it's going to be blessed, it's going to prosper, and we're not going to lose it. Amen? Amen? Amen. But you can listen to people. And, and, you know, okay, it's called the news. (laughs) Not the good news. News. And if it's not good news, it's going to be bad news. Why? Because if it bleeds, it leads. That's what they say. Bad news, and the worse it is, the higher up on the you know, list it gets. So don't turn on the television thinking they're going to tell you what's actually happening. Right? What they're going to tell you are the things to get you, oh, I can't believe that's happening. I've got to watch more. I've got to see where this is going. This is terrible. And their whole point is to get you hooked so that you're watching it. And then they want, because now you're seeing, and they're going to taint how you see it. And when, once they taint how you see it, now they're all, that means they're also going to taint how you say it. You know? And the biggest thing that most of it does now is just divide people. And used to, it was just this party or that party, and now it's them and us. And I hate them, and I'm not sure even about us. <laughs> you know? And it's just the way people think. And, and it's, it's an age-old thing, divide and conquer. Yeah. And so, so what do you see? Because what you see is what you produce. What you see is what you say. So what are you saying? What you see, you say. What you say, you have. According to Mark chapter 11, 23rd verse, 22 and 23. Isn't that right? You will have whatever you say. Now, so... What are we supposed to do? Remember, I remember years ago, and I'm finishing up here. Years ago, God to- told uh, Charles Caps. He said, I told my people they can have what they say, but they keep saying what they have. And if you're going to have what you say and you keep saying what you have, 
Just get ready to have more of what you got. Isn't that simple? So if you don't like what you have, change what you're saying. Now, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's going to presto change and all, you know, it's magic and it's going to happen overnight and, you, you know, and it's, no. It's like anything else. It, the Word of God is a seed and it grows and it starts. And at first you see it and you see it start to bulge up the ground and it breaks through and then you see the lead. So it takes a while. It takes time. Because you're having to turn this thing around and it's been going, you know, it's like a fast train. It's been going a long time and it takes a while for a fast train to slow down and turn around. You can't turn on a dime, right? So, what are we to do? Faith of Abraham, who imitated God and called those things which be not as though they were. Now notice, this is not, okay, this, this is not saying... I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. Okay? That's calling things that are as though they're not. That's not Bible. Bible is calling things that are not as though they are. Do you see the difference? See, a lot of people think, they really do believe that by saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not broke, I'm not broke, I'm not broke, I'm not, they really think they're doing the Bible. And they really are doing the exact opposite. And then they go, well, that stuff doesn't work. Uh, it, it does work. And if you'd work it, if you would do it right, it works, right? And if it's not working, that should be the first clue you're not doing it right, right? Why? Because if it's of God, it should work. Because what God does works. Amen? So, finally. So what would you say instead? By his stripes, I'm healed. No matter what. No matter how you feel. No matter what the doctor says. No matter, no matter what. what do you, now I'm not telling you what to do and what not to do as far as, you know, treatments and all that. Kind of, that's all up to you. That's, that's between you and God, you and your doctor. Who are, you are. Sometimes some people's God is their doctor, but that's a whole other, whole other sermon at some point. But all I'm saying is that if you're going, you know, look, if you're going to be Christian, then do Christian stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> don't, I, I don't get it. It's like people, you know, they, they don't, they want to call themselves Christian and yet they want to do Buddhist practices. It's like, if you're going to do it, do what you say you are, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't, well, but I want to be with this group, but I don't really agree with them. Then why do you want to be a part of that group? Yeah. Right? <laughs> So just do what the Bible says and do it the Bible way and watch it work in your life because the Bible works. God didn't give it to us just to, you know, well, that's a nice book. No, he gave it to us. This is an instruction book. It's an owner's manual, right? And tells us. He made us. He knows how we work. And so the first thing we should look at is go, is it working? If it's not, let's change it. Let's find out where, where we're messed up because this book ain't messed up. Why? Because this is the, the literal, the, the infallible word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So what are you going to do? You're going to call those things which be not as though they were. And when you do, you're imitating God. Yep. We have the example of Abraham. We have the example of Jesus doing this very thing. I mean, he spoke to a dead man and said, come forth. That, that, that makes no sense outside of faith. Right? right? So we can do all these things, but at some point, we have to actually do these things. So really, it comes down to now, bottom line is, what do you see? Because what you see is what you're going to have, because that's what you're saying, as we've already said. So you've got to decide what you're seeing. Now, you can look. You know, you can turn on the TV, and you can see a bunch of stuff. You can go on YouTube and see a, a bunch of stuff that's going on. And that's what you'll see. And when you see that, you're going to say that. Or you can get in this book. And you can see the invisible. Why is it invisible? Because it's not seen here yet. You, it tells you about it here in words. And then whenever you take these words, but you see it in pictures, you take these words in a form of picture, that's called hope. Amen. That's the blueprint. And once that picture is formed, bless God, by his stripes I'm healed. What would I look like healed? Oh, this is what I would look like healed. I would actually be walking around this way. I wouldn't be walking around this way. I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be doing that. And you start to get that picture in your mind and in your heart 
of what you would look like well. And then you start saying, you know what? By his stripes, I'm healed. Bless God, by his stripes, I am healed. Bless God. And then somebody goes, well, how are you feeling? Bless God, by his stripes, I'm healed. <laughs> well, I didn't ask you that. I asked you how you feel. Well, what does that matter? Yeah. What matters is what this said. Why? Because I'm looking at the invisible. That's right. And when I look at the invisible, the impossible becomes possible. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that's how faith works in a nutshell. But you got to change what you see. Because if you don't change what you see, you're only going to keep seeing the same thing that you've been seeing. Yes. Amen? Amen? But if you change what you see, you can change what you see. There you go. How's that? All right? Deep thoughts. <laughs> All right? Y'all get anything out of this today? Well, we're going to stop right there. Hey guys, hey, I just wanted to welcome you. I'm Curry Blake, uh, General Overseer of John G. Lake Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to take the step to investigate life teams, becoming a certified divine healing technician, getting plugged in and taking the responsibility to enter into the life that Jesus has actually died to give us. So the next step now, since you've come this far, is to simply sign up. That's how to get started, just sign up. And when you do, now you're going to go and check your email box and you're going to get instructions on how to become certified DHT, how to start a life team. Uh, but, you know, and, and maybe some of you are already within JGLM and you're already a leader at some level and you're saying, okay, why do I have to do this? Well, it's very simple. We're putting everybody into the same system so that it works like a well-oiled machine, like we've talked about, because we want to make sure everything is working very well together. So uh, if you are an existing leader within JGLM, we can tell you nothing's going to change. We're just gathering the information. So it's all in one database and we are going to be able to communicate with you a lot better. This is, this is going to really solve the communication problems that uh, we've, we've had over the past. But this is a new day and you get to get right into it. So sign up, do it now. Don't wait, do it now. And then check your email box. It's just that simple. So listen, I really appreciate this. Jesus appreciates this because you're plugging in and you're wanting to take responsibility. So I look forward to working with you. We're going to have a great time advancing the kingdom. God bless you. We would like to thank our partners and friends for making today's broadcast possible. If you enjoyed today's message or would like more information and resources, please visit our website at jglm.org. Rise up and heal the hurt. Rise up and be the light. Rise up and fight the fight. Come on and rise. We've got to rise. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world. Visit jglmmedia.com to watch this program and more at any time. Subscribe for full access to our entire library, or you can rent, buy, and watch for free select resources. With over 700 hours of teaching to watch and more being added, we've got your needs covered. Declare his truth. We're the ones who cannot lose. We've got to rise. Satan's head, it's time to rise.